Okay, this is Rocky Johnson, and you are in the EPA Wrestling Center. You're listening to Interactive Wrestling Radio, featuring the interactive interview, courtesy of WrestlingEpicenter.com. Hi, this is James Walsh from the Wrestling Epicenter. Is this Sheila? This is Sheila. Hi, it's a pleasure to speak with you. Um, uh, Alexandra. Yeah, Alexandra from ECW Press said uh, that this was your number. So, is this a good way to um, to speak with Rocky Johnson? Yeah, we do. Yes, sir. You can give him just about 30 seconds. He'll be right with you. I'm looking forward to it. I appreciate it. Are you guys doing a lot of these today? Back to back to back to back. He said back to back to back to back. I'm sorry. Well, hopefully I get you in a good mood. Less than three minutes ago from the last one. (laughs) Well, hopefully I get him in a good mood. I'm sorry to put him through this. No, he's in a good mood. Okay. He enjoys his stuff. Enjoy the live. <laughs> Rocky. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I enjoy the li- I enjoy lying to people. <laughs> <laughs> Only Rocky. Okay, I don't want you. I just did change my question. Okay. Okay, how you doing? I'm doing good. How about yourself, sir? It's a pleasure to talk I'm to do- you. I'm doing great. It's good talking to you. All right. Uh, are you ready to get started? Ready as I'll ever be. All right. I'll get started and recording in five, four, three, two, two one. Welcome back. Ah, you threw me off. <laughs> Welcome back to Interactive Wrestling Radio. On the Newsmaker line with us right now is a WWE Hall of Famer and a true legend in the world of professional wrestling. I must admit, I'm a little starstruck to welcome on the show Mr. Rocky Johnson. Mr. Johnson, are you with me? Yes, I am. It's a pleasure being on your show. It's a pleasure talking to you. It's uh, honest, honestly an honor to have you on. Um, of course, I got contacted by ECW Press. They mentioned that your book was coming out. It looks great. I mean, it's called Soul Man. It looks like a great book. I can't wait to read it. It comes out in a few weeks. What made you decide to finally put pen to paper and, and put your autobiography out there? Well, I retired now. I'm just sitting down here in Florida, just working out, playing around with the horses and fishing and stuff like that. And I decided, well, I'm going to write a book and so let people know what the wrestling business is all about, the good, the bad, the ugly. Because when they look at it today and you look at these guys on TV and that, they think they're all superstars. They have no idea what some of these guys are like myself 30 years ago had to go through to get to where I'm at today. Absolutely. And I think that's going to be a very interesting part of the book is, is hearing about um, how wrestling wasn't always like WWE is now where these guys become instant overnight superstars. You guys had to pay your dues, if you will. Pay your dues is not the word. I mean, they never smartened us up or nothing. They took us in there. They never broke bones, but they take to you, they take you to the limit and make you pass out. Then make you see if you had it or if you didn't have it. Out of uh, the, the school I went to, out of forty guys, I think like five made it, and I, I guess I was fortunate enough to be one of them. But then you know they made you respect the business and had a meaning. And now you can be one hundred fifty pounds and pay two hundred dollars, which I'm not knocking these guys, and they can go out and make money and have wrestling and they become a professional wrestler. But how long do they last? Three or four years. Absolutely. I know, I know. Well, you mentioned in another interview, because I've been doing my research, that you were considering doing this as a movie presentation instead of a book. What made you decide to do the book, and is the movie still potentially something you might do? Yeah, I wanted to do the book first and then feed off the book, see how it goes, and then uh, I would like to to do it into a movie or uh, a documentary or something, you know. Very cool. Now, Soul Man is a cool title, and it has special meaning to you, if I recall. Um, what is the meaning of Soul Man? What did, where did you come up with that total title? I did. They did. Uh, you remember Dick Clark had that rock and roll show, and, and uh, I was in California, and they had a show. 
And he had bandstand, and then they American bandstand, it, right? Yeah, yeah, and they took it to California, and they called it Soul Brothers, where they had everybody on there dancing and singing. And I was wrestling there; I was the champion, so they called the office, and they go, "You know, it'd be cool. We could get Rocky Johnson to come down because I used to dance and shuffle in the ring and all that, you know." Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I went on, and not knowing they were going to have me up there dancing and everything, but they kept these two girls, and I'm out there dancing with them. Then the guy said, "You're not a Soul Brother; you're a Soul Man." <laughs> and that's how the name that, that's how the name stuck. Awesome, awesome. Now you did do some some foot shuffling in the ring, which I know Muhammad Ali was known for doing. Uh, is there a story there behind you two maybe doing that at one point together, not even we realizing that it, it would together. become a thing? <laughs> we did it together in Toronto. When I met him in Toronto, he was still Cassius Clay, and uh, he was doing a shuffle, and I was watching him, and we put on a a tape, James Brown, Night Train, dum 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 dum. And we started doing tone heel because where I come from in Nova Scotia, there's nothing to do. So we used to go in the barn and put a piece of plywood down and, and do step dancing, you know, heel and toe, heel and toe. So that's why the shuffle became pretty easy for me. And he went on to call his Ollie Shuffle, his greatest of all time, which he was. And I, and I want to say he was a great guy, a great person. I loved him to death. And uh, the rest is all history. Maybe through your relationship with Muhammad Ali, do you think that's where Rocky got the idea to be call himself the Great One? Maybe borrow a little bit from Muhammad Ali? I think he took a little bit from this one, a little bit from that, a little bit, little bit from <laughs> me, but he says he didn't, you know. Uh, and then uh, he went on, and I was the one that, when he was Rocky idea, I told him that's not going to click, and it didn't. And he said, well, what, what should I call myself? I said, well, figure something out, just call yourself the Rock. And that's that what works. he did, and and uh, he went on to be, you know, how many times, nine, ten time world champion. You might not even be aware of it, but there's a whole lot of uh, guys who were writing the show back then who argue about who came up with the name The Rock. So you saying that you came up with it, I think you have a little more credibility than, than they do. I give him the name because he came <laughs> back, and he, he went up there as Rocky Maivia and trying to be a baby face, and everybody's hollering, Rocky sucks, Rocky sucks. <laughs> and he got discouraged and he got upset. And I said, just be yourself. And I, another thing I told him, I said, get yourself a belt that nobody can take from you. Call yourself the people's champion. There you and go. He, he went to Vince and Vince said, well, yeah, you can't hurt nothing. And it clicked. He is the people's champion. That's what he came up with, the people's champion. Very so cool. I'll take credit for that and I'll take credit for giving him the name The Rock. Awesome. Awesome. We'll ask a few more questions about Rock, but we're here to talk about you today. So, <laughs> um, You were a World Tag Team Champion, the first black World Tag Team Champions in the WWF, and with Tony Atlas. Tony's joined our show a number of times over the years, and you know, I was surprised to, to see in another interview that you did that you guys aren't on the best of terms, because he always said nothing but nice things about you when we talked. Um, what's your relationship like with Tony Atlas now? Uh, I've never said anything bad about him. We were just two different. We had two different personalities. He had his way, mm -hmm. and I had mine. And, you know, he, he was big, strong, good athlete, on steroids, and he was moody. And he was telling me uh, what I should do and what I shouldn't. And I said, hey, you wrestle your style, and I'll wrestle mine. I mean, he really didn't care for it, you know. And yeah. he kind of got mad. He wanted to be the leader. That was the thing. You know, if you want to be the leader of the team, you want to be the lead horse. I didn't have a problem with that. But you're in the ring, and he's in the ring working, and they're on, and I'm on the apron, and they're hollering, Rocky, Rocky. What does that tell you? You know. Exactly. That tells you everything you need to know. You're right. And that's what I said. And then when I went in, Vince McMahon called me in and told me, because before that, he had got fired, and he brought me in, and they said, look, I got this idea, because Vince seen how the wrestling business was changing. So he goes, I'm going to bring Atlas back. Uh, if you can handle them, and I'm going to make you guys the first black world tag team champions. I guess he thought I should have done backflips and have been happy, but I said, you can bring him back, and I got no problem with him. I really didn't know him that well at that time, but I said, I'm not my brother's keeper. What do you mean if I can handle him? Well, someone said, well, we had him here before, and he was doing drugs, and then he was doing this, and he wasn't showing up, so we had to get rid of him, and that's why we brought you in. So I said, is that the only reason you brought me in? If you didn't think I could draw money or do anything, you wouldn't have brought me in. But it was changing because they never had an Afro-American or a black at that time that was champion. And he didn't want Absolutely. to take the shit. He really, I don't think he wanted minority because I think the world's belt, they should have had been with Jimmy Snooker, but I'm not the promoter. 
But mm. so he said he'll, he'll go with the tag match, you see. And it clicked. The people really bought it. I mean, we sold out every place. Absolutely. And that's kind of my next question is you were a part of that WWF machine that was starting at the early stages of taking over the industry and becoming what it is today, as we mentioned earlier in the conversation. Um, what did you think yourself of the WWE kind of swallowing up everybody around them and, and seeing the end of the territories that you were a big part of as well? You know, I know you worked Hawaii and, and, and San Fran and all that. Me, it bothered me a little bit, like there was nothing I could do, but it was said that we're going back to that Memphis where I was a Southern champion. We're wrestling mm -hmm. in Georgia opposition. I was a Georgia champion for the NWA. Now I'm with the WWE. So either I go with them or I don't have a job because I knew he had so much power. And Vince was smart that he knew the TV was starting to click. So he tied up all the TVs. Even Ted Turner tried to go against them. You remember that? Yeah, and, absolutely. And how long did he last? Four or five years? And he's a all-time billionaire. It's all having yeah. the right connections, but it takes a crude band to, to, I watched them walk on a lot of, of people's toes, you know what I mean? There's nothing they could do about it. Very cool. It's always cool when I hear people talk about the best drop kicks of all time, and some of the younger ones, they'll say, oh, well, this guy had a great drop kick, but everybody that knows, knows that your drop kick was amongst the best there's ever been. What made that drop kick so special? What made it different than everybody else's? I don't know, because the way I did it and the way I practiced, I, I, I learned, on, I took a punching bag and I had it hanging up and I drop kick it and drop kick it. And every week or two, I would put it up a couple inches higher, a couple inches higher, till I got to the fact where somebody six foot five or six foot six, I could hit him in the head straight out, you know, yeah. and not hurt him. So, so you mentioned WCW. You mentioned. I'm sorry. I, I was, I'm sorry. I stepped on you. I stepped on you. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, Everybody kept saying, well, you're the king of drop kicks, and they started pushing it. And if I didn't do my drop kicks, Vince would get mad. I said, how come you didn't drop kick And I said, well, my knee's hurting a little bit. My back is sore. Well, the people don't know that. They're paying to see. I said, okay. And I was like, go. You know, so you were just a workhorse. Ah, uh, man. But if you're going to be what? a workhorse, be the lead horse, you know. That's the way I looked at it. So. Very cool. So something that I always thought was strange, and, and you know, you could tell me if I'm asking something too personal, but when Rocky made it to WWE, I remember that you were at WrestleMania 13, but you didn't really make many appearances as you see a lot of other guys' dads appear, a lot of second generation guys, like Randy Orton had uh, Cowboy Bob would show up quite often and be part of stories. John Cena's dad, who was, you know, really more of a manager on the independent right. circuit, but he made appearances. Why yeah, didn't you ever kind of there. do a lot? I didn't, yeah. I didn't really want to. I, I, wanted, I passed the devil on to him, and I didn't want to be in all the shows. I didn't want to be in all the WrestleManias and stuff like that. I wanted him to make it on his own, which John Cena's father, and him, don't get me wrong, that gives John Cena a good push. And, you know, mm -hmm. but I didn't want to give him a push. I wanted him to, to push himself, and that's what he did. Very cool, very cool. And your son got to play you on TV. Before he was the big movie actor that he is now, yeah. he got to play you on TV on The 70 Show. Was that cool to see your son cover uh, or do your, your yeah, uh, act? It, it really was because they, they had sent me a contract. I had to sign that they could use my name, Rocky Johnson. And then I watched it, and uh, and I thought it was very funny. I still have to take hmm. it. Was very just, cool. It was just a bit part, but, you know, Look at, him, look at him now. Absolutely. So a lot of guys I have on the show, they say, ah, the WWE Hall of Fame, it doesn't mean anything. What, who, what's the qualifications? But I've heard you say in the past that the Hall of Fame means a lot to you. And the fact that you were put in and your name is cemented in history means a lot. What does the WWE Hall of Fame mean to you? And then, just as you said, and then a lot that they thought enough of you and had enough respect and you've proven yourself that you can become a Hall of Famer. Like how many wrestlers or how many hundreds or how many thousands of wrestlers and how many that are retired and how many are Hall of Famers? And exactly. That, in my day, it meant something. I put all these years in and they thought enough to say, this guy is good enough that we can make him a Hall of Famer, which I'm not bragging or anything, but I'm the only black Canadian in the WWE Hall of Fame. And Absolutely. It, That's definitely it. Yeah, it, made a lot of, it meant a lot to me. Absolutely, and that means a lot to a lot of people. I mean, your your career, you know, is is uh, speaks to a lot of people. Obviously, myself, I'm 38. I grew up watching you and Atlas, you know, as a very little kid. So there you go. 
Oh, yeah, um, I, still, I still get recognized when we go someplace, or, you know, or me and my wife sitting down trying to eat and somebody will come in and sit down beside you without, you know, I remember you with this and that, you know, and you got to be nice. And, I don't know yeah. if there's anything here, but uh, a friend of ours, uh, we had a mutual friend, I believe, who's no longer with us. Any memories of Scott Epstein? Scott was a, a personal friend of mine. He, he was, was a great a, guy. He, he, he was a great guy. He got me some bookings. And it was so funny. You know, my 24th birthday, where him and this kid put on this big show up in New York, just signing. And I mean, there were three days, there was thousands of people there. So he had Rocky Johnson's birthday party. So we go to the bar, and then Pat Tanaka, one of the wrestlers, became the bartender. And they run the bill up there, $38,000. <laughs> Scott called me. <laughs> He said, you know what, that tech and nice what? He said, run that damn bill up. He was giving everybody double drinks, triple drinks. But <laughs> Scott was a great guy. I went to the memorial they had for him, the wrestling show. Yeah. Atlas, Atlas, Atlas wrestled, and I went, and I went, yeah. He was a personal friend. He was a good man. Absolutely. He used to talk he all the time. He at one time. Did he? I did not even know you. I know you. he did stuff there, but I didn't know he was actually on the payroll. Oh, yeah. He took the, the films from... from uh, Philadelphia, the Washington, and make sure, you know, we done TV in Allen, South Pennsylvania, and Ar Harrisburg, and he would have to make sure the tapes got shipped to Washington, or they got shipped here, or they got shipped there. Every now and again, he would give me a call, and he'd tell me stories about yourself and, and, and Rock when he was a little guy, and, uh, and and Bruno San Martino, he just, I think he knew I ate that stuff up, so I don't know where he'd just call me up and say, hey, I wanted to tell you about, and he'd tell me a story, so he was yeah, just he an was awesome just guy. Dwayne. He used to take Dwayne across the street to this deli. Corn, you put Dwayne like that corned beef on rye. And every time we went to Madison Square Garden, I always took him with me. And uh, he, he, Scott would come to the hotel, and they'd go across the street and have their corned beef on rye. Awesome. And Scott. Awesome, awesome. So circling back to the book, and we'll let you go, because I know you got a lot of these to go today, but I appreciate you taking the time of doing this. For fans who aren't already, you know, chomping at the bit for October when the book comes out, what can they expect from this book? What can they expect to hear and learn that they might not know about Rocky Johnson already? Well, they can expect right from uh, my childhood all the way up to today. I think that's what I wanted the book to be, to let people know everything I did, how I did it, what I went through, all the prejudices I went through. Uh, I got a chance to go all over the world. Uh, I, my greatest memory, I walked inside the pyramids in Egypt, but a lot of people can't, uh, can never say that they have. And, I'd like to go back today for one more visit, but I kind of scared now, so I don't think I'll go back. But I just wanted to leave something there that people can say, okay, this is Rocky's book, and show how it changed from 40 years ago to today. So how is it going to change five or ten years from now? Absolutely, and we're in a an era of change right now. WWE going to Fox Network with SmackDown, your name, a show that your son named. Uh, this AEW, a new company being birthed over at TNT, speaking to Turner again. So this is kind of a changing year in 2019, but I'm glad that we have a, a piece of history that's being released. And I got to tell you, there's a lot of people, myself included, who can't wait to get their hands on it and read through it. I appreciate it. And once you read it and everything, I expect to hear from you. Give me a call so tell me what you thought. We can keep touching bases. I appreciate that. Hey, before I let you go, do you mind if I ask for one little favor from you? Yes. Do you mind if I ask for a, st a station ID just saying this is Rocky Johnson and you're in the wrestling epicenter? Okay, this is Rocky Johnson and you are in the Epa Wrestling Center. You got it, man. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Hope you have a great day. Okay, you keep in touch and thanks very much for everything. <laughs> This is Bruno San Martino, and you're listening to the interactive interview. It's Vader time. It was Vader time in 2009 when the Wrestling Epicenter welcomed Big Van Vader to our show. Yeah, uh, he did. He picked it here up uh, you know, off the ring and carried it to the back where I believe Chuck was we would get something off to do, but they never they never reattached it. Guy. He has that long hair, so you don't really see it. But uh, they never reattached the hair, so it looks pretty ugly. 
This sensational interview is available in our extensive archives at interactivewrestlingradio.com and wrestlingepicenter.com. Thank you, everybody, for listening to the interview here at WrestlingEpicenter.com. And now, here we are with a little bit of an old-school segment, old-school recording style, and it's James Walsh joined, as always, as it was in the day, by my buddy Patrick Kelly. Mr. Kelly, are you there? I'm doing fine, James. How are you doing? Doing great, doing great. It's been a little while since we recorded anything with any kind of an opinion on it. But you know what? With what's going on right now in wrestling, I think we almost have to offer some take on uh, on the wonderful changes that are happening. And, and I know that could sound sarcastic, but I'm not being sarcastic. It's really awesome where we are in wrestling right now. Yeah, we have something to be excited about. Um, various changes going on in WWE and their programming and uh, certain new shows on the horizon. So, uh yeah, it's like wrestling's taking over the week, it seems, when you look at Monday through Friday. It's like it's just nonstop wrestling throughout the week. It is, it is. Let's do it let's go through it real quick. You got Monday, you got Raw. Mm-hmm. Tuesday but Supposedly you know, they're changing the set to Raw, so they're probably gonna update the look to Raw. We'll see how much that actually means, but uh yeah, should be interesting. More or less, it hasn't changed that much in quite some time. Oh, no, it, it, the shows look basically the same since, like, 99, I would say, maybe 98. 98. Well, basically, the only difference is it looks a little more high-tech. But, but for the most part, yeah. they had the Titantron and, and pretty much the same sa- stage set up for all that mm-hmm. time. So it's, it's really, it needs a fresh coat of paint. And I think this, it, it's a good thing. It's a good change. Mm-hmm. Then Tuesday, you got Impact Wrestling coming to Access TV, which is great. Wednesday, cool, cool. Wednesday, you got WWE NXT. I'm the only one who puts the WWE in front. Uh, and then, of course... <laughs> it, uh, yeah, they just had their second episode tonight. Um, the show's been going pretty well. I mean, they're action-packed from start to finish. It's just, you know, eventually they're going to have to start having promos and angles. Um, and, you know, these 30-minute matches are going to... They're going to get old after a while, and I think that's true for all the shows. It's like you don't have to give us a five-star match every week. You just have to keep me hooked, keep me invested. Speaking of 30-minute matches, AEW on TNT Dynamite. <laughs> yeah. Yep, yep. I will be attending this show next week. Get out of here. Really? Yep. Got tickets off StubHub, and actually one of my friends who's going, uh, he's taking his son, and this is going to be his son's first wrestling show, so oh, uh, we're going to make a, a big deal out of it, yeah. you got to let me know how that turns out, because I'm looking forward to seeing what that looks like on TV. And... Mm-hmm. Do you, do you notice when you see, like, still pictures of AEW events that it almost has a WCW feel to it? Oh, absolutely it does. And I mean that in a good way. Right. There was a picture of I the mean, Young Bucks. The one show they did, uh, the one show they did that was in like the theater, um, that was a really unique setup. And WCW always had that kind of experimentation to it with their sets, like Back to the Beach and um, you know different nitros. Uh, you know, depending like on where Club the Club Vila when they had the the ring on the on the on the pool. Yeah, yeah, stuff like that. It's like that, you know, stuff like that helps the show stand out. It makes it look different, look cool, and it gives it a different feel. And I don't know. I guess sometimes it gets a little easy to kind of get set in your ways and just do the same exact thing week after week. And you know, my mindset is, why bother traveling if the show's just going to look the same every week anyway? So I agree. Um, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I'd say take steps to make the show look different. And I think so far AEW has kind of done that. Yeah, we'll have to see what they do week to week, but that's really, really a good point because, like we're saying, we're happy to see a new set on Rob just because we're so tired of seeing the same look. It's just like, yeah. Mm-hmm. Every now and again, you change around your living room at home because you just get sick of looking at it. So, you know, you, <laughs> same concept for, for a wrestling arena, I would say. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, Thursday we get that because I, I was looking at my couch today and I was like, you know what? I think it's time to get rid of that thing. Uh, Thursday, close. Yeah, Thursday is, I think we get the day off. I don't know if there's any wrestling on Thursday. Uh, none that I'm aware of. And then, of course, Friday, you got WWE on 
Fox, the return of SmackDown mm-hmm. on Fox, on network programming, which is very cool. I say the return because it used to be on uh, UPN, which was on network TV. So SmackDown returns to network programming, which is very cool. Um, yeah, and we've got our main event lined up. It's going to be Brock Lesnar versus Kofi Kingston for the, the WWE title. I hear that, and I think Brock's probably going to go over. I think Fox is going to want somebody like a Lesnar, and I, I've heard talks that they want to get Ronda Rousey to, and names like that to kind of draw people to the program. Uh, there's even reports going out there that Fox wants Bray Wyatt right. on SmackDown. Right, yes. I was so just yeah, he's the best character in the WWE right now by far, so it's no surprise that Fox would be requesting to have that character on their show. Oh, yeah, he's interesting. My kid, we don't watch WWE all the time, but when we watch it, he said, what's his story? What's, what's, he, what's he about? He's interesting. He's, he asks mm-hmm. me about him like out of nowhere, like we'll be in the pool. He's like, so what is this Bray Wyatt character? What is this about? So he, it gets in your head and you want to know more about it, and that's kind of what I'm getting at. And WWE doesn't always succeed with that, especially mm-hmm. not recently, but they definitely have with Bray Wyatt. So that's good. I'm glad I'm glad for him. I like Bray Wyatt. I talked to him when he was I, old. I think he's one of the better talents out there and I thought uh I thought his career was over, to be honest, as far as like being any kind of a big star because they just always had him lose. And I was like, Well, you want to kill a character, just have him lose all the time but I don't know. With this new setup and this new presentation, he's like risen from the ashes like a phoenix. So hopefully this goes well for him. Absolutely. And of course, by the way, back on our track, um, Ring of Honor appears on network television. The Sinclair Broadcasting's on Friday as well. So Ring of Honor's out Mm -hmm. there. Um, It's syndicated, so you can get it on different nights. But Friday's supposed to be the night they're on. And then, of course, you also have, on Saturday, New Japan Pro Wrestling and WOW! Women of Wrestling on Access TV as well. That is, you know, everything like that is kind of up in the air as we approach um, what what's going to happen with Anthem purchasing Access TV, which is gigantic and huge. And I'm so happy for them, by the way. Impact Wrestling, you said it the other day, they're the company that just can't die. You know, just when you think it's like, I, I don't know how this company's still alive. Something happens that keeps them afloat. I don't know how. Um, I feel like they... I feel like they should have been dead like eight or nine times by now, but I guess they're they're like the feline wrestling promotion. They've got nine lives. Well, I'll tell you what. If you watch their show, and, I, and I've said this a lot of times, and MLW is on Saturday as well. I can't believe I almost forgot MLW. If you watch their show, Impact Wrestling, it's a good show. It really is a good show, and they've got some really good stories going on. And you've got some of the best talent in the world. Tessa Blanchard, Rosemary, uh, Sammy Callahan. These people, I almost said guys, but two of them aren't guys, are three of the best performers that there are, period. Not in Impact, not on outside of WWE or outside of WWE and AEW. They're three of the best, period. They're just freaking awesome. So if you're sleeping on Impact, don't. And um, i got to get you watching AEW. I really do got to get you watching AEW. I'm sorry, MLW. <laughs> I MLW, this. I'm like, oh, dude. <laughs> MLW. <laughs> yeah, I got to get you watching MLW Fusion TV. Yeah, I've heard great things about it. I just haven't. Uh, where where can I see MLW? It's on B in Sports on Saturday night, but it's also up on YouTube. So if you just type in MLW Fusion, every episode's up there. They upload it on Monday night at 7 o'clock, right before Raw comes on. You can watch oh, it. okay. Yeah, you could watch it, the, the show, in case you don't get be in sports, because a lot of people don't. You get to watch it online, and it's really good, and it's there whenever you want it. Really good stuff. I, I'm really digging on this Hammerstone character. Um, he's in a faction with MJF, who everybody's come to realize is just phenomenal. The man? Yeah. Oh, he's great. And he's Yeah, MJF, I love that kid. He's everything I love about wrestling. And, and of course, Rich Holiday, who is, uh, by the way, Rich, Richard Holiday is the protege of um, Paul Roma. And there's a lot of relevance there. There's a lot of, uh, uh, maybe relevance wasn't the right word. They resemble each other, I'll say. And in a lot of their way that they present themselves. And that's not an insult. That's actually a compliment. I love Paul Roma. I, I love anybody who does a, uh, an interview on a Paul, on a uh, four horsemen DVD. 
And they ask him, mm-hmm. what was it like to be on the Four Horsemen? And he's like, yeah, no big deal. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not what they want to hear. They want to hear it was the greatest thing that ever happened to you and that you never knew that. The... I didn't know he was on the DVD. I never saw the Four Horsemen DVD, but I, I didn't know they even bothered getting him to be a part of it. They did. Yeah. He basically, okay. and he was he wasn't that complimentary to Flair either. But you got to remember, that was a very controversial time in in WCW where everybody was jockeying for position. Mm-hmm. And and this is even before you know the the NWO and all that. This is just it is what it is. And we did that great interview with him in ninety in two thousand ninety six two thousand six, and he's talking about the night that he <laughs> he schooled poor. Poor Das Wunderkind, Alex Wright. So that was that's out there in the archives. Uh, yeah, I'm seeing a lot of Alex Wright these days because I've uh, I told you a couple nights ago I'm uh, watching all the old nitros from '95 to '99. I I found my cutoff point in '99, probably around the time the set gets destroyed. But um, that was and that was probably one of the last really great moments and and nights in Nitro history. Sure, absolutely. That was the Page and Hollywood Hogan match, right? Right. They destroyed the set. It was in Canada. And for whatever reason, the real American is over like crazy in Canada. Um, mm-hmm. and, and it just worked well. And Flair did the run in and Hogan Hogan got the win on page. It was really just a good night of action. And the. Um, yeah, that was just really a good. I, that was also the sync. I think it was the same night that Brett did the, the plate with Goldberg, isn't it? It might have been. Now that you mentioned, it might have been the same night. May well have been, because it was in Canada, so it would make sense, wouldn't it? Mm, yeah. <laughs> well, they hold multiple shows in Canada, so who knows? Yeah, but I mean, it was a night show in Canada. They didn't always run Canada. Canada was like, mm-hmm. I don't know, maybe twice a year kind of thing. <laughs> all right, so we got a lot of really good stuff to be watching, and and they're all good shows in their own ways. So this is cool. And the NWA, I didn't even mention it. The NWA is doing a studio show. How awesome is that? You were telling me about that, yeah. Yeah, Jim Cornette's going to be doing commentary on it, as well as Joe Galley, who's a award-winning broadcaster, really good uh, guy. He called championship wrestling from Arizona and championship wrestling from Hollywood. So he knows his stuff mm-hmm. with, with wrestling, but he's also a legitimate sportscaster. Mm-hmm. So you got the straight man... You're Lance Russell, if you will, and then you got J- uh, Jim Cornette to tell the stories and also be Jim Cornette on a studio show, and you got guys like Eli Drake, who in that format, I got to think he's going to shine like crazy because there's a lot of promo work on a studio show. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Which I kind of like as I've gotten older. Like those smaller type of shows are, are more appealing to me because again, it's I talked about it with NXT a little bit. It's like I like it when it's mostly promos and angles, and then it builds to the big matches at the big show. And sometimes with so many shows going on, and you know, two hour, three hour show, you got to fill, you got to have a half hour match on every show, and it just kind of feels like too much. But something about the simpler times, simpler build ups. Uh, I'll tell you a perfect example of it was the build up in the Bruno Larry Zbysko feud. I mean, that was done beautifully. That was, and that was not really a, a studio. It was like a smaller arena in in, in Pennsylvania, sure. but they definitely used that kind of environment, that format. I mean, a lot of people, you know, and, and this was discussed on one of the other podcasts. It was Jim Cornette's podcast that a lot of people look back at studio wrestling and see, oh, well, that's the biggest crowd that those guys performed in front of. It was essentially an infomercial. Right. Those shows were not all they could fill arena-wise. They were mm-hmm. television broadcasts to sell tickets for the live events. And the live events mm-hmm. took place in front of five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten thousand 10,000 people. So a lot, a lot of all it you know, fits people that want to minimize the, the importance of Southern wrestling and, and do that show like the fucking thing on the network that I hate um, – <laughs> Southern Regional Wrestling or whatever the hell it was. I'm sorry, I wasn't in on that joke. I didn't like that at all. Um I never saw it. Oh, everybody thought it was just the, the just the hottest and, and, and funniest thing on the planet. And and you know what? A lot of those guys I know grew up watching Southern Wrestling and they didn't do it with malice. 
But mm-hmm. I just took it as such a piss, such a load of piss on it. Just just pulling it, pulling it out, of, whipping it out, and pissing all over it. And it's like, you know what? You don't need to do that. You don't need to do that. It just doesn't do anything for me. But anyway, um, yeah, no, that's going to be a great format for the NWA. And, and with the guys that they're bringing in, with the Nick Aldises, who could cut a promo like crazy and I really think is good. Um, Eli Drake, they're bringing in Eddie Kingston, who was king in Impact. Um, and, and as you mm-hmm. found out, he can talk like, like nobody's business. So a lot of guys... Oh, he's a great talker. I saw some of his work in Chikara. He was really good there. Yeah, James Storm is their national champion as well. So you got a lot of great talent that can cut promos. And in that environment, in that studio, I think that the shows are going to, they're both will have a nostalgic feel, but I think that they'll bring it into the 21st century. And you're going to see a lot of guys shine. I really do think so. Now, where can we find the NWA show? I don't know. (laughs) I have no idea. Nobody knows. We'll find out. We'll get there when we get there. Well, that's kind of what I'm worried about. It's it, it in that sense, it kind of feels like GFW amped, where Jarrett goes and records these shows, and then like they end up on a DVD sold by Impact, and then Impact deletes the master tapes, and Jarrett throws a shit fit. Or um, what was the other one? The other one was like the XWF, where they got Hogan versus Henning on there, and they're shopping that tape around, and nothing ever comes of it. So. Eventually, it gets released on on there, out there for you to see, but it doesn't become anything. I don't want that to be the case with this. I hope this gets picked up, picked up quick. And you know what? If it has to be on YouTube or Twitch or whatever the case is, for the short term, that's that's fine. Um, I do still think that wrestling, as we're talking about all these shows that are going to be on wrestling TV, still needs mm-hmm. the television medium. Absolutely, and that's why AEW is so exciting. It's like after all these years, we're getting wrestling back on TNT, which never thought I'd see that again. Right. The only thing that'll make it better now is if, like, the right after uh, AEW Dynasty uh, Dynamite, if they show they live, you'd be like, "Yeah, <laughs> we're back to 1996, and this is perfect." That that couldn't be any better. <laughs> That'd be great. All I right. watched that recently. It's a great movie. It is a great movie, man. That's a great movie. The greatest fight scene ever. It goes like 25 minutes. <laughs> yeah, it does. I, I love, uh, I mean, we all love Roddy Piper, but Keith David, I mean, that guy, I, I've always had, really, really liked him as an actor. So He had, I mean, there was another movie he did that it didn't really make any waves, but it's my favorite one of his, and if you can get it, do so. I think it's on Amazon Prime uh, for free. Hmm called Marked Man. Okay. Really, really good movie. Um, he basically gets framed for a crime. It's a little bit like The Fugitive, and he's running from the law. Mm-hmm. It's a little bit like The Fugitive with Roddy Piper in it, essentially what it's like. But it, but it's not as, as rip-off-y as I just made it sound. But it's a really good movie. <laughs> okay, sounds good. All right, dude. Well, I only wanted to go 10 minutes. We've already gone almost 20, so there goes that. But <laughs> There you go. I hope everybody enjoyed our interviews with the great Rocky Johnson, as well as with Ring of Honors, the Bouncers, and that was really an interesting interview. They're they're cool guys, man. I, I hope people really enjoyed that that interview. Rocky was really cool. He told me after the show to give him a call after I read the book and tell him what I thought of it. That was really neat. Um, and then mm-hmm. these guys were like having lots of fun. They do a thing. You might appreciate this. They do a promo at the end and they're like, I'm I'm Brian Malonis. And I'm the Beer City Bruiser. And together we're and in my head I'm going, The Wild Stallions <laughs> But <laughs> Of course they didn't Love do that. that. By the way, are you excited for Bill and Ted three? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> didn't know it was a thing, but shit. Oh, it's a thing. It's a thing. I will say this, Bill and Ted's Excellent adventure. You know where they have, um, oh, God, is it Nero going down the water slides? And Napoleon, I thought. Napoleon going down the water slides. That's right here in Mesa, Arizona. That's the water park there, and it hasn't really changed at all. Very cool. I've gone down those slides, and we're sitting there watching. I'm like, you know what? Those look almost like the slides we go down. And then you saw, like, the background <laughs> channel. like, wait a minute. 
that's the castle that's in the background. What the? And then we look it up. It's like, oh yeah, sure. It sure was filmed right here at a place called uh, Golfland Sunsplash here in in Mesa, Arizona. A place I've been wow. to probably a hundred times. Very nice. So I sl- I slid down. It's kind of like around my area. We have the uh, we're <coughs> excuse me. We're close by to Georgetown University, mm-hmm. and The Exorcist was filmed around this area. And um, the the famous Exorcist steps is like a bit of a like a tourist attraction around these parts uh, for movie buffs. Are they really making a Bill and Ted three? Are you are you kidding me? They are absolutely making a Bill and Ted three. Uh, what are they going to be like fifty five years old? <laughs> Keanu's up there. I don't know uh, the other guy. Uh, they got to be the same. Age. Bill. I don't know how old he is, but. Yeah, well, Keon just made he made like John Wick and all this other stuff, so he's still in good shape. I don't know if he can still believably play like a stupid brain dead stoner, but you know, we'll see. We shall see. Yeah, no, The Exorcist steps. That's very cool. I, I didn't even realize that was filmed in Maryland, but there you go. Oh yeah, well DC, but you know, yeah. close enough. Oh man, you just ruined my day. They're also going to try and remake Back to the Future. It's one of those things that I hope gets shit canned before they ever do it. Uh, Robert Zemeckis, the original director, has said over his dead body. Don't do it. Take from that what you will. It's fine the way it is. Just watch the original. Well, everything gets remade these days, so, you know, because original ideas are a bad thing, apparently. (laughs) So with that negative (laughs) thought, we tried to be positive, but we went negative. Anyway, at least not on wrestling. Everybody on the film industry, it's fine. They deserve it. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) All right, guys. Well, thank you guys for listening. Thanks, Pat, for doing this with us. And uh, we'll hope we talk to you soon with more big news about what's going on in wrestling. Maybe when the NWA announces where their stuff's going to air, we'll we'll do another one. Sounds good. All right, man. Hey, it's Tony Schiavone, and you're listening to the Wrestling Epicenter. And I would stick around, but I'm desperately out of time.